hi guys so honor Rover here and today we are starting um a series of videos that will be counting down to halloween i've been so excited to start this series of videos for a while now and i'm not sure if i'm gonna do it like as one select video or break it up into multiple parts or or what um but anyway so for this October, counting down to Halloween, I am going to do 17 dramatic readings of spooky stories. So it's going to be 17 spooky story dramatic readings counting down to Halloween. And like I said, I don't know if I'm going to have it be like one solid upload for each dramatic reading or if I'm going to break it up. I think it's going to depend a lot on the length of the story and how my editing software like cooperates and stuff like that. So let's get on to the first book that we're going to be reading is Nancy Drew's Mystery Stories number six. It is The Secret of Redgate Farm and as you can see I put on a little inspired outfit from Nancy's outfit on the cover like she has the white collar and a pink sweater and a skirt and I have a white collar a pink sweater and a red skirt so yeah I definitely want to do some inspired looks um, to go along with the stories at least for these intros maybe for the actual videos if the book doesn't have illustrations um, but yeah this way you know we get some fun outfits and stuff like that. So I hope you guys are excited for this series because I know I am and so yeah let's read Nancy Drew and the Secret of Redgate Farm. Number six Nancy Drew Mystery Stories The Secret of Redgate Farm by Carolyn Chapter 1. A Strange Fragrance That oriental-looking clerk in the perfume shop certainly acted mysterious, Devin Bess Marvin declared, as she and her two friends ended their shopping trip and hurried down the street to the railroad station. Yes, Nancy Drew answered thoughtfully. I wonder why she didn't want you to buy that bottle of blue jade. The price would have discouraged me, spoke up Bess, Bess's cousin, dark-haired George Fane. Her boyish name fitted her slim build and straightforward, brizzy manner. Twenty dollars an ounce! Blonde pretty Bess, who had a love for feminine luxuries, laughed. I was extravagant, but I just couldn't resist such yummy perfume. After all, Dad gave me money to buy something fat. Frat, fat. Frivolous, frivolous, so I did. Frivolous, so I did. Nancy by this time was some distance ahead. Hurry, girls, or we'll miss the next train to River Heights. In her active life, the attractive, titan haired young sleuth had learned that being on time was important. The three 18-year-old girls continued their frantic pace until the railroad station finally came into view. Once at the station, they set down their packages to rest their arms. Phew! Bess sighed, looking at her watch. 
I didn't think we'd make... I don't... I didn't think we'd make it, but we have two minutes to spare. And this would be one of July's hottest days. Nancy was pensive, still contemplating their encounter with the mysterious woman in the oriental perfume shop. She had realized the blue jade was too much too expensive, and the unwillingness of the young woman to part with it had stimulated her interest. interest. Instinct had told Nancy that there must be some special reason why the saleswoman had been so reluctant to sell the blue jade. Then another idea struck her. You know, she said aloud, it's possible that saleswoman deliberately raised the price of the perfume. George frowned. But why? You'd think she'd be thrilled to make such a good sale. Yes, Nancy agreed. That's what perplexes me. There's something very strange about about it, and I'd certainly like to know what it, what it is. Oh, Nancy, teased George. There you go again, dreaming up another mystery. Nancy's blue eyes sparkled as she thought of the prospect. The young sleuth had already solved several cases. Some of them were... Some of them for her father, Carson Drew, a famous criminal lawyer. Among the cases on which Nancy had worked were Secret of the Old Clock and The Secret of Shadow Ranch. The girls heard the train approaching and approaching the station. As it came to a halt, they quickly gathered up their packages and hurried about. What a day! Bess exclaimed as she pushed on through the cars. The train was crowded, and the girls walked through several cars before they found any vacant seats. George and Bess began discussing their many purchases. Bess gloated in particular over the bottle of exotic perfume. Even though the package it, even though the package was wrapped, it gave off a slight fragrance which was very pleasant. George took a quick inventory of their purchases, then laughed. Bess, it's a good thing we got you to leave that la last apartment store. You wouldn't have had enough money left to buy your ticket home, she stated bluntly. You should practice more you should practice self control the way I do. Self control? Bess retorted. I suppose you call a new hat, two dresses, three pairs of stockings, and a handbag self control? George mustered a smile and decided to drop the subject. Nancy leaned her head back against the cushion as she relaxed, studied the faces of the nearby passengers. She thought that the thin, sweet-looking girl who occupied the seat just opposite looked very tired, worried, and even ill. Nancy Nancy judged the girl to be her own age. Why are you so quiet, Nancy? Bess demanded suddenly. Just resting, Nancy returned. She did not tell her friends that she had become interested in the nearby passenger. For, Be for George and Bess often teased her about her habit of scrutinizing strange faces. However, it was Nancy's lively in interest in people that was largely responsible for her involving her in unusual adventures, and she was always on the alert for a new mystery. Bess eyed her perfume package longingly and finally ripped off the paper. I can't stand it any longer, she sighed. I must try some of this delicious smelling stuff. She opened the bottle and dabbed a couple of drops just behind her ear. 
Then she offered it to George. Try some. It's really lovely. Makes me think I'm in the Mystic Orient. George could not keep from making a face. No, thank you. She replied firmly, it's not my type. Nancy and Bess laughed. Then Bess offered some to Nancy, who accepted willingly. Bess again tore, took out the stopper and was leaning over to put some perfume on Nancy when the train lurched and jodged jo her arm. Oh! Bess cried in horror. The perfume sprayed over Nancy as the bottle fell over to the floor. Such a waste of money, George muttered as she picked up the half-empty container. What a shame, Nancy exclaimed. It's your perfume. It's your perfume, Bess, and now and now I have a lot of it on me, Bess groaned. I should have waited till I was home to open the bottle. I'm lucky there's some left. Carefully, she placed the small vial in her handbag. By now, the concentrated odor of blue jade had permanent the, the car and and passengers in nearby seats flung open the windows. <laughs> I'm glad we're getting off at the next stop, Nancy giggled. Everyone is laughing at us. Nancy had become so engrossed with the spilled perfume that she had forgotten about the pale young woman who occupied the opposite seat. Now, as Nancy turned her head, she she was startled to see that the girl had slumped down in a dejected heap. She's fainted, Nancy explained, moving quickly across the aisle. She shook the girl gently, but there was no response from the frail figure. Bess, ask if there is a doctor in the car, Nancy asked urgently. By the time other passengers in the car were aware of that something had happened and were crowding about, asking unnecessary questions and getting in the way, Nancy politely asked them to move back. There, there did not appear to be a doctor in the co coach, but as Nancy rubbed the girl's wrists, she was relieved to see that she was showing signs of recovering consciousness. George quickly raised the, the window so that the fresh air fanned the girl's face. Leaning against, leaning against the seat, she looked deathly pale. What can I do? George asked. Stay here while I get some water, Nancy answered. She's coming around now. I, I think she'll be all right in a few minutes. Nancy hurried to the water cooler at the far end of the car. As she was trying to fill the paper cup, a man who had been standing near the doorway came toward her. He made a pretense of waiting, a pretense of waiting his turn to get a drink. Yet she realized by the intent look on his face that something had startled him. He was deliberately studying her. Was it because of the perfume? She fairly reeked with it. Nancy was not prepared, however, for what came next. The man edged closer to her, glanced quickly about to see that no one was close by and muttered in a guttural tone. Any word from the chief? Nancy was completely take. Nancy was completely. Nancy was taken completely by surprise. She knew she had never seen the man before. For she. 
would not have forgotten such a cruel fate. The steel gray eyes bored straight into her. Nancy was so bewildered she could think of nothing to say. The stranger realized at once that he had made a mistake. Excuse me, Miss Myra, he murmured, starting for the car ahead. But that perfume, well, never mind. Chapter 2 Mysterious Numbers Nancy stared after the stranger and wondered what he could have meant. Evidently, he mistook me f for somebody else, she thought. But even so, his actions certainly are p were peculiar. What message had he expected to receive from her? Who was the chief? How strange, how strange that the man should speak of the perfume as though it had been the cause of his mistake. If Nancy's mind had not been occupied with the frail girl's condition, she might have wondered more over the strange encounter. She dismissed it for a moment, quickly filling a cup with ice water. She rushed back to, to George and Beth, who were, giving, who were giving first aid to the girl. Do you feel better now? Nancy asked. Here, drink this. Thank you, the girl muttered gratefully, taking the cup. I feel much better now, Shh. she added quietly. It was very kind of you to help me. It must have been the perfume that made you faint, George declared. A little is all right, but half a bottle is overpowering. I'm sure it wasn't the perfume, the girl returned quickly. I haven't felt well since I first boarded the train early this morning. What a shame, Beth said. I'll get you some more water. She soon returned with a second cup. By the way, Nancy, Beth turned to her friend. Who was that man who spoke to you at the water cooler? You noticed him? Nancy asked, surprised. Yes, Beth said, but I didn't but I didn't recognize him, nor did I, Nancy remarked. The whole thing was quite mysterious. He simply approached me and said, any word from the chief? The chief? Beth and George chorused. What chief? I have no idea, the young sleuth admitted. But evidently it was the strange perfume that attracted his attention or so he said, I wonder what the perfume could have to do with it. Bess looked perplexed. By this time, the train was slowing down as it approached the River Heights station, and Nancy and her friends realized they must hurry or they would miss their stop. I'm afraid that we must interrupt this conversation and say goodbye, Nancy told the girls reluctantly. We get off at River Heights. River Heights? The girl glanced anxiously out the window. I get off here too. I had no idea we were so close. We'll help you, Nancy offered. Do you really feel well enough to walk? Yes, I'm, I'm all right now. George and Bess collected the miscellaneous packages while Nancy helped the stranger along the aisle. The girl hesitated uncertainly as she stepped from the train. I'm not very familiar with River Heights, she said to Nancy. Which direction should I take to go to the center of town? You're still too shaky to walk any distance, George spoke up. Have you, have you no friend here to meet you? The girl shook her head. Then why don't you come home for a snack with us? Nancy suggested. I left my car parked here by the station and I can drive you back. The girl s started to protest, but Nancy and the others urged, urged her on. And soon they were 
all settled in Nancy's blue convertible. I haven't even told you my name, the strange girl said, leaning back wearily. I'm, I'm Joanne Bird. I live with my grandmother and at Redgate Farm, about 10 miles from Round Valley. That's where, that's where I took the train. Nancy introduced herself and her friends as she started the car and headed toward the Drew residence in another section of the city. How nice it must be to live on a farm, Bess remarked, and Redgate is such a pleasant sounding name. Redgate is a lovely place, Joanne said feeling, feelingly. I've lived there with my grandmother ever since ever since I can remember. We don't we don't have the the money though to keep the farm. That's why I left home today to find to find work here. Do you do you have something in mind? Bess questioned. I came in response to a to a particular advertisement, Joanne replied, but did not, but did not say what it was. A faraway look came into her eyes. We, we simply must raise enough money to pay for the long-standing interest due on the mortgage of our farm, or Graham will lose it. Surely no one is mean enough to take over your farm, Bess murmured sympathetically. A bank holds the m mortgage. It, it has no choice. Graham knows very little about money matters, so she takes anyone's advice. Years ago, she was advised to buy another farm and sell it at the highest price, at, the, at, the, at a high price. All at once values crashed and she couldn't meet the payments on her extra farm, so it went back to the original owners. Then she had to put a heavy mortgage on Redgate, too. And if she loses that, she'll be penniless. As Joanne finished her story, Nancy turned the car into the Drew's driveway. Come in, everybody she invited. Perhaps we can think of a way to help Joanne. The three girls followed Nancy into the house, where they were greeted by the Drew's pleasant housekeeper, Hannah Gruen. Had, Hannah Gruen had been like a mother to Nancy ever since the death of Mrs. Drew, when Nancy was a child. Nancy, Nancy asked Hannah to make some sandwiches for them all, then led the girls into the living room. You must be nearly starved, Nancy said to Joanne a moment later. I know I am. I am rather hungry, Joanne confessed. I haven't had anything to eat since last night. What? The other girls chorused. It, it was my own fault, Joanne asked hastily. I was too excited this morning to think about food. It's no wonder you fainted, Nancy said. I'll ask Hannah to fix you something hot. Nancy returned from the kitchen with a tray of appetizing sandwiches and a bowl of soup. Joanne ate heartily. Nancy and her friends join, joined in, for, for they had, had had only a light snack while on their shopping expedition. I do feel better, Joanne announced when she had finished. It was so good of you to bring me here. Not at all, Nancy said softly. We'd like to to help you all we can. Thank you, but I believe everything will work out. All right, if only I get this position. Joanne glanced anxiously at the clock. 
I'll really have to go now, or I'll be too late to make the call this afternoon. Could, could you tell me how to get to this address? She full. She handed a folded scrap of newspaper to Nancy. This particular ad for an office girl caught my eye. It asks for someone who has had experience on a farm. Nancy found the advertisement to be rather conventional, but it was but it was the name at the bottom of the paragraph that held her attention. Why, this ad says Riverside Heights, she exclaimed. You should have stayed on the train until the next stop. I thought Riverside Heights and River Heights were the same place. Joanne Bird cried in distress, distressed height, surprise. Riverside Heights is only a few miles away, Nancy exclaimed. The names are confusing even to people who live here. So it's a natural mistake. Oh dear, I don't know what to do now, Joanne said anxiously. If I don't apply for that position this afternoon, I'll probably lose my chance of getting it. Nancy had taken a liking to the girl and wanted to help her. Not only was Joanna half sick from lack of food, but she had worked herself into a nervous state. You must let me drive you to Riverside Heights, Nancy insisted. It'll only take 15 minutes and you'll have plenty of time to apply for the position. Joanne's face brightened instantly, but she, ha she was relux reluctant to accept the favor. I've really troubled you enough. Nonsense. We'll start right away. Nancy turned to Bess and George. Want to come along? Bess and George both declined, since they were expected home. The cousins gathered up their packages, and all the girls went to the car. Nancy dropped Bess and George at their own homes, then took the highway leading to the next city. I do, I do hope I get there in time, Joanne said worried, worriedly. The job will mean so much to Graham and me. You'll get there, Nancy assured her. Have you ever applied for a job before? No, I've always helped Graham run the farm until now, Joanne explained. I felt I was more needed there than anywhere else. We keep a farm hand, we keep a farm hand but a great deal of work still falls upon me. The girl soon reached Riverside Heights, and Nancy had no trouble finding the address mentioned in the advertisement. It was a run-down section of the city, but Nancy did not mention this to her companion. Here we are, Nancy said cheerfully, stopping the car in front of a dingy-looking office building. Joanne made no move to get out of the car, but sat nervously pressing her hands together. I'm a terrible coward, she confessed. I don't know what in the world to say when I go in. I wish you'd come with me. I'd be glad to, said Nancy, as she turned off the ignition and locked the car. They entered the building. There was no elevator, so the girls climbed the dimly lighted stairway to the third floor. Soon they came to room 305, which had been mentioned in the advertisement. There's no name on the door, Nancy observed, but this is the right, but this must be the right place. As they stepped into the reception room, Nancy noted that it was dirty and drab. The two girls glanced at each other, exchanging expressions of disappointment. <sighs> At that moment, a man came from the inner of inner office and surveyed the girl sharply. He was a tall and wiry 
with a hostile pen, pen, penetrating eyes and harsh features. His suit was bold in pattern and color and his necktie was gaudy. Well, he demanded coldly. Joanne found significant courage to take the advertisement from her pocket. I saw this in the paper, she stammered. I came to apply for the position. The man stared at Joanne critically, then at Nancy. You looking for the jo job too? He asked. Nancy shook her head. No, I'm here with my friend. The man looked at Joanne again and said with a shrug of his shoulders, Go on in the other room. I'll talk to you in a minute. Joanne cast Nancy a doubtful glance and obediently stepped into the inner office. Look here, the man addressed Nancy. Wouldn't you like that job? I could use a good-looking girl like you. I'm not looking for work, thank you. Nancy returned aloofly. The man was about to make a retort when the telephone rang. He scowled and went over to the table at, to answer it. As he lifted the receiver, he looked nervously back toward Nancy. Hello? He growled into the phone. This is Al. Shoot. Nancy listened to his end of the unbusiness-like conversation and watched him reach for paper and a pencil and began to scribble down a line of figures. This in itself would not have seemed so peculiar except that he continued to eye Nancy suspiciously. He kept on copying figures. All the while, Nancy watched him curiously. Okay, Hank, he muttered just before he hung up. You say you found a girl? Fine. We can't be too careful this, in this business. All this time, Nancy was wondering what kind of transactions went on in this office. There had to be no indication on the door of what business the man was engaged in, and nothing in the room gave her any clue. She realized now that Joanne's chances of getting the position were slim, and Nancy was actually relieved. She was very suspicious of the whole setup. I was just taking down some stock market quotations, the man remarked lightly as he crossed the room toward Nancy. This isn't an investment house, is it? she asked. No, you wouldn't call it that exactly, he answered with a smirk. We run a manufacturing business. I see, Nancy murmured, though she really did not understand at all. What do you manufacture? The man pretended not to hear and moved on into the inner office where Joanne was waiting in, in haste to escape further questions. He forgot to pick up the sheet of paper with the numbers on it. Nancy was curious about the telephone conversation and could not resist the temptation to take a peek at the notation. She stepped silently over to the telephone table and glanced at the sheet strung out across the top and the bottom of the pages were numbers. The top row read 1653, 112, 129, 1562, 16, 882, 0, 9, 1, 56, 18. Stock, no, stock quotations. 
like fun. Nancy told herself, why did he lie about it? He must have been afraid I'd discover something. As, un as usual, Nancy was intrigued by at any hint of a mystery. She studied the row of odd figures. Suddenly, it dawned on her that they might be a message in code. Nancy looked qu quickly toward the inner office. The door opened, but the man sat with his back toward her. She did not dare to pick up the paper. If only there was enough time to copy the code. With one eye on the office, Nancy took a sheet of paper and frantically scribbled the numbers, carefully keeping them in their right order. She could hear Joanne's soft voice. Then she, then her prospective employer talking loudly and realized the interview was coming to an end. She had copied only the top row of numbers, but dared not spend any more time at it. She put the copy into her bag and slipped back into her chair just a moment before Joanne and the man emerged from the inner room. She glanced toward the telephone gave a start and rushed across the room with a muttered ex exclamation with a muttered excla exclamation he grabbed the paper and thrust it into his pocket Nancy's heart was beating madly as she forced herself to remain outwardly calm he stood with a cold look on his face his eyes fixed on Nancy. Chapter 3. Work on a Code Had the man heard her rush from the telephone table? Nancy wondered. Was he suspicious of her actions during his absence? If so, what reason did he have and what business deal was he hiding in this dingy excuse for an office? Nancy pretended not to be not to notice his penetrating questioning eyes but but she was but she was ill at ease the hostile man spoke up you girls better get out of here he blurted out i got no more time to waste and don't bother to come back nancy and joanne looked hastily at each other and moved toward the door. Once outside the the building once outside the building, Nancy breathed a sigh of relief relief and turned toward Joanne, who was close to tears. Don't feel bad because you didn't get the job, Nancy said gently as they walked to the car. You wouldn't have wanted it, I'm sure. That man was detestable, Joanne shuddered. I had just given my name and address when he started to shout. You must have heard him, Nancy nodded. I think he had already found another girl to work for him, she said. At least I heard him say something like that over the phone. I knew I wouldn't get the job, Joanne sighed dejectedly. He told me I wasn't the type. I'd count my blessings if you were. I'd count my blessings if I were you said Nancy so, so soberly. There's something strange going on in that office, and I'd like to know what it is. What do you mean? Joanne asked quiz quizzically, quizzically. Well, Nancy began carefully, I'm not sure my suspicions are just but I have a hunch there's something shady about the telephone message he got when you were in the inner office. 
Nancy explained about the series of numbers on the sheet of paper and how she suspected they might form some sort of code. At any rate, Nancy went on, we can't be sure of anything, so this must remain confidential. Joanne nodded and fell silent. Many thoughts raced through Nancy's mind as she remembered the day's encounters. First, there had been the perfume bottle and its mysterious saleswoman. Then, the curious man on the train who had been attracted by the strange fragrance. And now, this cruel, gruff man in room 305. What should I do now? Joanne asked for forlornly. I can't go back to Redgate Farm and let Graham down. I simply must find work. Why not come work for me? Nancy suggested as they paused beside the car. I'll be glad to have you as my guest for the night, and in the morning you'll feel better, and I can decide what to do then. No. I totally said that wrong. I'm sorry. Why not come home with me? Nancy suggested as they paused beside the car. I'll be glad to have you as my guest for the night, and in the morning you'll feel better, and I can decide what to do then. Joanne shook her head proudly. Thank you, but I wouldn't think of letting you go to any more trouble. I have a little money. I can find a boor boarding house, and I'll keep on looking for work here. Nancy saw that Joanne was disappointed and discouraged, and hated to leave her on her own, but finally conceded. I guess you're right, she admitted, but at least let me help you hunt for a place to stay. Joanne accepted, for the, accepted the offer gratefully. Even with the car, it was difficult to locate a pleasant room. Joanne could not afford a high-priced place, and the cheaper ones were unsatisfactory. Finally, however, they found a suitable room on a quiet street, and Nancy helped Joanne get settled in. I may... I may be driving over this way tomorrow, she said. If I do, I'll stop in and see what luck you're, you've had. I wish you would, Joanne invited shyly. I'll need someone to bolster my morale. All right, I will, Nancy promised. After a few words of encouragement, she said goodbye and then drove slowly towards River Heights. Her mind again forced on, focused on the various events of the day. I don't know what will happen if Joanne, I don't know what will happen to Joanne if she doesn't find work, Nancy told herself. It would be a shame of her, if her grandmother loses Redgate Farm. I wish I could do something, but I don't know of any available jobs. It was nearly dinner time when Nancy reached River Heights. As she passed the Fane home, she saw George and her cousin Bess on the front lawn and stopped to tell them about Joanne's unsuccessful interview. Isn't that too bad? Bess murmured in disappointment. She seems like she seems such a sweet girl. I'd like to know her better. I promised to I'd drive over to see her tomorrow. She told the girls, "Why don't you why don't you come along?" "Let's," George said enthusiastically. "I love going places with you. We always seem to find a, some sort of adventure." Nancy's blue eyes became serious. "I'd say this has been a pretty full day. I can't seem to forget that 
that mysterious saleswoman in the oriental perfume shop or the strange man on the train I wasn't going to say anything to you about this but something odd happened this afternoon in the office Nancy then related the mysterious actions and the behavior of the man named Al you mean you think his telephone conversation was a little on the shady side? Bess asked, wide-eyed. It seems that way to me, Nancy answered. I doubt very much that it's a manufacturing business, and those numbers I copied from his pad were anything but, were anything but stark stock market quotations. Well, here we go again. Never a dull moment with Nancy around. George laughed gay gaily. Don't be too impatient, George, Nancy advised with a grin. We don't have we don't have proof that any of today's incidents is really cause for suspicion. At this mo at this moment a foreign make car went by, and Nancy glanced casually at the driver, then gave a start. He was the man who had spoken to her on the train. He slowed down and stared at the three girls and at the Fane house. Nancy felt at once that he was memorizing the address gave a self-satisfied smile and drove on. Nancy noted his license plate number. I almost feel as if I'll hear from him again, she told herself, then revealed to the girls who had not noticed the car, car's driver, then that, that he was the man who had confronted her on the train. He's still interested in you, Bess teased, but George found nothing to laugh about. I don't, I don't like this, Nancy, she said seriously. I remember he had a hard, calculating face. Nancy, too, remained serious. A disturbing thought had suddenly occurred to her. Why? She told herself, that man must have been trailing me. But I wonder for what reason. She determined for the moment at least, not to mention her suspicions aloud and dropped the subject of the mysterious man Presently, she bade Bess and George goodbye, climbed into her convertible, and drove home. I think I'll ask Dad what he thinks about that man Al's mysterious phone message, Nancy decided as she hopped from the car. She had often taken some of her puzzling problems to her father. He, in turn, frequently discussed his law cases with his daughter and found Nancy's suggestions practical. You look tired, dear, Carson Drew observed. As she entered the living room and sank into a comfortable chair. Have a big day shopping? I can't remember when I... I can't remember when... So much ever happened to me in one day, Nancy smiled despite her fatigue. I suppose I'll be getting the bills in a few days, her father remarked teasingly. It wasn't just the shopping, Dad, Nancy returned gravely. Nancy now plunged into the story of the oriental shop and the dropped perfume bottle of her encounter with the stranger on the train and the strange fact of having seen a short having seen him a short while ago in a foreign make car 
What do you make of it? She questions. Mr. Drew shrugged. What did he look like? The man seemed very polite, but he had a cruel look in his eyes. Nancy gave a brief description of him. Mm. Mr. Drew mused. I can't say I like the sound of this. I wouldn't wonder about it, said Nancy, except that the girl in the shop seems so reluctant to sell the perfume. Why do you suppose she cared whether someone bought it? Maybe she was instructed to save it for special customers, Mr. Drew suggested. Dad, may have something there, Nancy exclaimed. She told her father about Joanne Bird and described, described the office which she had visited to, which they had visited together. She ended up showing him the figures which she had copies. This was almost all of the special message, she explained. I didn't have time to copy the rest. Can you figure it out? Carson Drew studied the sheet of paper. I'm not an expert on codes, he said firmly, but I suspect this might be one. Since the man lied in saying these figures are marketing market quotations, can you decipher it? Nancy asked eagerly. I wish I could, but it looks like a complicated one. It would probably take me days to figure it out what these numbers stand for. Why don't you work on it yourself? I don't know too much about codes, Nancy declared, but perhaps I can learn. I have a book you, I have a book you might use, her father offered. It may not help much since every code is different. Still, all codes have some features in common. For instance, in any language, certain words are repeated more frequently than others. If you can figure out the, a frequent ta frequency table, then look for certain numbers to appear more often than others, you may get somewhere. I'd like to try, Nancy said eagerly. This, this will be a good test for your sleuthing mind, her father s said teasingly. If you don't figure out the code, you can always turn this paper over to an expert. Not until I've had a fighting chance at it myself. Nancy answered with spirit. I'd really like, I'd really like to help you with this mystery, her father said, but I'm so tied up with this Clifton case, I just can't tackle anything else right now. Immediately after dinner, Mr. Drew retired to his second floor study to work on his law case. Nancy went to her bedroom to read the book on code. When she finished, the girl detective took out the sheet on which she had copied the numbers and studied the figures intently. I'm sure the numbers stand for letters of the alphabet, Nancy told herself. They must have been arranged in some pattern. For over two hours, Nancy tried combination after combination and applied it to the code. Nothing showed up until she hit upon the plan. The four letters of the alphabet in sequence by number. The next four in reverse. Alternating in this manner and leaving two in the end bracket, Nancy scrutinizing 
what she had worked out. I've hit it, she thought excitedly. The living room looked so dark and dreary that they preferred to wait outside in the car. It's too bad Joanne has to stay in a dismal place like <clears throat> It's too bad Joanne has to stay in a dismal place like that, Nancy remarked, especially when she's accustomed to farm life. I sure hope she finds something, Bess added. Maybe maybe luck will be with her today. Within 15 minutes, the girl spotted Joanne at, at a distance. She did not notice the car and, unaware that she was being observed, walked slowly toward the rooming house, her head drooping dejectedly. So you didn't, she didn't get the job, George murmured. I feel so f sorry for her. As Joanne approached, Nancy called out to her. Joanne glanced up quickly and mustered a smile. No luck today? Bess met question. None at all, Joanne answered with a sigh. She came over to the car and stood leaning against the door. I've tried half a dozen places, but I couldn't land a thing. I'll just have to try again tomorrow. In the face of such spirit on, on Joanne's part, the girls could not do anything but encourage her, though secretly they feared she would have no better luck the next day. How about coming for a short ride? Nancy invited. I'd love it, Joanne accepted eagerly. It's so hot and stuffy in my room. She hesitated, then added, Of course, I guess it is anywhere these days. Nancy took a road that led out of the city, and soon they were driving past cultivated fields of corn and wheat. Gradually, Joanne became more cheerful. It's so good to be out in the country again, she declared, gazing wist wistfully toward a farmhouse nestled in the rolling hills. That place looks something like Red Gate Farm, only not half as only not half so attractive. I wish you could all visit me there sometime. So do we, Nancy said enthusiastically. Wouldn't it be wonderful to hike over hills? and breathe in the fresh, clean air. I've always wanted to spend a vacation on a farm, Bess declared longingly. Just imagine having cream an inch thick. Just what... Just what you need for it reducing, her cousin teased. You wouldn't have to worry about that, Joanne smiled. We keep only one cow. Then the girls later left Joanne. When the girl, when the girls later left Joanne at the door of her boarding house, they had the satisfaction of knowing she was more cheerful. She was in a more cheerful frame of mind. We'll keep in touch with you, Joanne. Nancy promised, as they said goodbye. I have a feeling we'll be seeing a lot more of each other, Joanne called after them. So please, do call me Joe. I'd prefer, I'd much prefer it. Joe it is, they agreed merrily. Goodbye for now. Nancy and her friends had just started back to River Heights 
when Nancy checked her gas gauge and decided to stop at a filling station. The girls were idly watching passers-by when suddenly a young woman walked, walking with m menacing steps because of her extremely high heels attracted Nancy's attention. Nancy gasped in recognition. There was no mistaking the distinctive oriental features. The clerk from the per perfume shop. Nancy turned to her companions. Look at that girl who just crossed over. Isn't she the same one who sold you the perfume, Bess? You mean the one who tried to not sell me the perfume, don't you? She j Bess joked. Yes, she's the same girl. Their eyes followed the girl up the street. She had not she had not glanced toward them, but had passed the fi filling station and continued on. Now what can she be doing here? Nancy wondered. She got out of the car and stood watching the girl, who entered an office building a short distance farther up the street. That's funny, Nancy said to her friends who were peering from the car windows. I think that's the very same place where Joe applied for the position. For a position. You don't suppose that perfume girl has two jobs, do you? George questioned. I'd sure like to find out, the young detective answered. Just then an attendant approached. Nancy paid him and stepped back into the car. We must try to follow her, she declared, starting the motor. They pulled up near the office building into which the young woman had disappeared. You two wait here and keep watch, Nancy said. If I'm not back in a few minutes, you'd, you'd better come and see what's going on. Aye, aye, sir, George said mockingly. We're at your service, but be careful. Nancy alighted, hurried up the street, and went into the, the building. The halls were deserted. Evidently, the girl had gone into one of the offices. But which one? As Nancy stood uncertainly, staring up and down, she spotted a handyman coming down the corridor. Did you see a girl come into the building just a moment ago? She, she inquired, Oriental. The man demanded, resting his, resting on his broom. Nancy nodded eagerly. Yes, she. Yes, she looks rather oriental. Oh, you mean, Yvonne Wan. Do you know her? Nancy said, thinking that, with, the name Yvonne, the girl was probably part French. No, but I heard that, the. That man she works for with the loud voice and the swells, swell clothes, call her by that name. She works here? Nancy inquired in surprise. Yes, so. She must be a new girl. Came here yesterday. Let's see. Nancy murmured, thinking Yvonne Juan had managed a rather sudden change of jobs. Could you tell me in which office she works? Her questions evidently had begun to annoy the handyman. In 305, if you're so interested, he said briskly. Why don't you go in and ask her what you want to know? Thank you, Nancy responded with a polite little sm polite smile turning away I won't trouble you any further Nancy had taken 
only a few steps when she thought of one more question and came back. By the way, she said in a casual tone, what sort of office is 305? The man regarded her suspiciously. How should I know? He demanded bluntly. They don't pay me to go sticking my nose in other folks' business. I got my own work. Nancy could see that she was not going to learn any more from the man. So she left the building and joined Bess and George, who were waiting anxiously at the door. Well, what did you manage to find out? Bess qu queered as the three girls walked toward the car. Quite a bit, Nancy answered, Med meditative meditatively she was certain that she could not have been mistaken Yon, Yvonne Wan was the same girl who had who only yesterday had waited on them in the oriental shop why had she changed positions well George broke into her thoughts don't keep us in suspense don't keep us in suspense. Nancy answered all their questions as she drove toward River Heights, explaining that the young woman's name was Yvonne Wan, and that she was a new girl in the office, the same office Nancy and Joanne had visited. But what about Yvonne's job at the Oriental Perfume Shop? Asked George. I don't know, Nancy admitted, and a handyman wouldn't give me any indication as to the type of business it was. Nancy recalled the strange telephone call which had made, while she and Joanne were in the office. She distinctly remembered that some mention had been made of a girl who had been found for the position and that the man who called himself Al had said that one couldn't be too careful. I wouldn't be so suspicious of, about Yvonne, Nancy added. Except I have this feeling she didn't get that job by chance. She must have been chosen because she was especially suited to the situation. Whatever that is. There's something underhanded about the whole thing. But we haven't much to go on, Bess declared. Nancy agreed. Some clue may turn up. Anyway, we have to, th we have Joe to think about for the time being. It's getting dark as Nancy dropped off Bess and George at their homes. It rained so hard the following day that Nancy stayed indoors and tried to figure out the remaining symbols of the code using the same alphabetical key. 16 was M, five equals H, two, could be B, and 18 stood for R, M, H, B, R, Nancy pondered. That doesn't make any sense. Perhaps those marks over and under the letters are second code. She reasons, only I could decipher them. I might know who's calling what meeting and where. The next morning, a bright sun shone. While Nancy was busy with chores around the house, the phone rang and she went to answer it. Hello, Nancy? A quiet boy said a quiet voice. This is Joe. How are you? Oh, Joe, I'm fine. Nancy replied eagerly. Did you find a job? She asked hopefully. Not yet. Joe Ann answered sadly. 
But I have some other news. I hope it's good, Nancy said. I just talked to my grandmother on the phone. I must go home right away. She told me that soon after I left, a man called and made an offer to buy Fredgate. His price was so low, she didn't accept. He was very persistent, though, and gave her five days to think it over. Yes, Nancy prompt. Well, the other girl went on. In the meantime, Grandmother decided to raise, try raising money by taking in boarders. She placed an ad in the paper that same day. Good for her, Nancy exclaimed. Has she had any replies? No, Joanne said, worried. Even though the ad hasn't run very long, Graham's discouraged. I'm afraid she has changed her mind and intends to take the man's offer. She said he's coming to Redgate tomorrow at five o'clock and, and bringing papers for her to sign. There was a pause. Then Joanne burst out. Nancy, I just can't let Graham go through with this. And if I'm not there, she'll accept the man's offer. She, she mustn't give up Redgate Farm yet. That's why I must get home and persuade her to sell. Not to sell. Persuade her not to sell. By all means, Nancy agreed. I suppose you'll take the train to Round Valley this morning? That's the horrible part, Nancy, Joanne said dejectedly. I'll only have enough money for train fare half half the way after I pay my room rent. No need for that, Joe, said Nance. Nancy said eagerly. You get your bag packed and be ready to leave at ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Chapter five. Money, money. As Nancy reflected on her plan, other ideas occurred to her. She was sure that Bess and George would love the chance to spend a vacation on the farm, since they had both mentioned it the other day. Nancy did some mental arithmetic and came to the conclusion that three steady boarders who paid their bills regularly might help to lessen the amount of the mortgage in interest, mortgage interest payments that threatened right gate and also keep Mrs. Bird from selling the place. Nancy thought, I hope Dad agrees to my tr making a tr the trip. That evening at dinner, Mr. Drew said, I'll be out of town for a week or so, Nancy. Do you think you can get some of your friends to stay with you? I have an even better idea, Nancy replied and smiled. She outlined her plan to help Joanne Bird. Her father consented enthusiastically, proud, as always, of Nancy's desire to assist others. It was not so easy to convince Bess and George when Nancy telephoned them. They both wanted to help Joanne and agreed that a week or two in the country would be very pleasant, but there were complications. If George went, it meant she would lose out on a camping trip. Bess had planned to go visit an aunt in Chicago, but admitted that the trip would be postponed. There's one thing about it, George said laughingly, as she finally agreed to give up the camping trip. I've never been with you yet. I've never been with you yet that we didn't run into an adventure or a mystery. Maybe a trip to Redgate will be exciting. Bess and George had no trouble in getting their parents' consent. It was decided that Nancy would pick up Joanne first and come back for the cousins since River Heights was on the way to Round Valley. Nancy packed her clothes that night after telephoning the plans to Joanne. 
As she was closing the suitcase, her eyes fell upon the copy of the coded message, which lay on the dressing table. I better take it along and work on it whenever I get the chance. Whenever I have the chance, she decided. Nancy got up early and the next morning and had breakfast with her father. After exchanging fond goodbyes with him and Hannah, she hurried to her car. It was close to 10 o'clock when Nancy reached Riverside Heights. She stopped at a downtown service station and had her convertible filled with gas and checked for oil. Then she drove to Joanne's boarding house. Her passenger was waiting. Nancy was glad to, to find Joanne see, seemed to be in better spirits. It'll be such fun. All of us going together, Joanne said, and I know Graham will be happy to have you stay as long as he like. Only on the condition that we are paying guests, Nancy insisted. We'll see about that later, Joanne said, smiling. They put her suitcase into the trunk of the car and soon were on their way back to the river back to River Heights. Assured by Joanne that they would be welcome at Red Gate, the cousins brought out their suitcases and put them in the luggage compartment. George took Nancy aside and said excitedly, A little while ago a man phoned here and asked for Miss Vane. When I answered, he said, Listen, miss, tell that snoopy friend of yours to stop her snooping or she'll be sorry. <laughs> then he hung up without giving his name. Nancy said her jaw then smiled. Whoever he is, he has a guilty conscience, so my suspicions were well founded. Who do you think he is? George asked. Either the strange man on the train who followed at me here or some, some accomplice of his. I'm glad for your sake we're going away, Nancy, stated George. Let's not say anything about this to Joe. Let's not say anything about this to Joe, Nancy advised as she and George walked back to the car. It's a perfect day for our trip to the country, Joanne said excitedly. George could see by, her, by the expression on Joanne's face that a visit to Redgate Farm with her new friends was far more important to her than any other plans the girls might have had. I agree 100%, George answered happily as she stepped into the car. And I'll be so glad to get out of this heat, Bess chimed in with a sigh. I spent practically the whole night dreaming about the cool, refreshing breeze in the country. As Nancy steered the convertible in the direction of Round Valley, she said with an eager smile, We're off to rescue Redgate Farm. Nancy and her friends thoroughly enjoyed the scenic route to Round Valley. They stopped for a quick lunch and then continued their drive. The winding roads led through cool groves and skirted sparkling little lakes. Each hilltop brought a different and beautiful view. Gradually, the wor worried expre expression completely left Joanne's eyes and, came, and color came into her thin face. She began to laugh heartedly at the antics of Bess and George as they rode along she told the girls a great deal about her home. You'll like Redgate, I'm sure, she said enthusiastically. We haven't any riding horses, but there are, will be plenty of things to do. We can explore the cave, for one thing. Cave? Beth questioned with instrument. How exciting! What kind is it? A home for bears or a pirate's den? Joanne laughed. There's a large cavern located on the farm. No one knows how it came to be there, but we think it must have been made made a long time ago by an underground river. 
You must have explored it before this, Nancy said. Oh, yes, of course. Though I'll admit I never did very thoroughly, and I haven't been near the caves for years. As a child, I was af always afraid of the place. It looks so dark and gloomy. Lately, I've been too busy working around the farm. We'll have to we'll have to put that at the top of our list, decla George declared. I love spooky things. Well, I'm not so sure I do, Bess admitted. Nancy laughed. We may even find hidden treasure in the walls. I wish you could, Joanne sighed. It certainly would come in handy. The hours passed quickly as the travelers alternately sang and chattered. Why, it's almost four o'clock, George announced in surprise. We've made good time, Nancy remarked. Bess spoke up pantifully. I'm half starved. It's been ages since lunch. I could go for a gooey sundae. The others laughed, but agreed they were hungry too. Let's watch for a roadside stand, Nancy proposed. I'll have to stop soon for gas anyway. We'll come to one soon, Joanne spoke up. We're in Rand Valley now. A few minutes later, she pointed out a combination filling station and lunchroom, which looked clean and inviting. Nancy turned the convertible into the driveway and parked out of the way of the other drivers who might want to stop for gasoline. The group entered the lunchroom and looked and took seats at one of the small white tables. They all decided on chocolate nut sundaes topped with whipped cream. Here goes another pound, Beth sighed, sighed as she gave her order. But I'd rather be pleasantly plump than give up Sundays. Though there were few customers in the room, the woman in charge, who also did the serving, was extremely slow with filling the orders. Twice, Nancy glanced at her watch. If you'll excuse me, she said, I'll step outside and get the gasoline. It will save us a little time and in getting started. Don't wait for me if our Sundays come. She drove the car over to the pump and asked an attendant to fill the tank. Before he could do so, however, a large, high-powered sedan pulled up to the other pump, coming to an abrupt stop almost parallel to Nancy's car. Give me five and make it snappy, a voice called out impatiently. The attendant glanced inquiring, inquiring, inquiringly at Nancy Drew. Do you mind? He asked. Wait on them first, if you like, she said graciously. Nancy observed the passengers with interest. There were three rather coarse-looking men accompanied by a woman. Nancy could not see the face of the driver, for it was turned away from her, but suddenly he opened the door of his car. I'm going inside and get a couple of bottles of ginger ale. She heard, she heard him grumble to his companions. As he stepped out, as he stepped from the convertible and turned Nancy saw his face. He was the mysterious man who had spoken to her the, that day on the train. In view of the telephone call, George had George had received. Nancy did not wish to be observed. She turned her head quickly, leaned down, and pretended to be studying a road map recognize me, Nancy thought, or see my license plate. 
To our relief, the man walked in front of the convertible without a side, side, word, side word glance. At that moment, the woman alighted and walked toward the lunchroom, passing close to Nancy's car. She was tall and slender with blonde hair that was almost shoulder length. Nancy's attention was suddenly arrest, arrested when she detected on, on the stranger a familiar scent. Blue Jade Perfume. After the, after the driver and the blonde woman had entered the lunchroom, Nancy gazed at the two men who remained in the automobile. They were, they were the sort Carson Drew would describe as tough customers. The blonde woman soon reappeared and got back into the sedan. Then the driver came out carrying the cold drinks without looking in Nancy's direction. He addressed the attendant harshly, saying, ain't you finished yet? <clears throat> Excuse me. He turned to one of the men in the car, handed him the bottle of ginger ale. Hold these, will you, Hank? I gotta pay this boyd. Nancy started. Room 305 called with his friend Hank over the telephone. She said to herself, could he be this person? Her attention was drawn back to the driver who was paying the attendant. He took a thick roll of bills from his pocket and with a careless gesture peeled off a $10 bill. Aren't you afraid to keep Aren't you afraid to carry such a wad around, sir? The attendant questioned, gazing admirably at the thick roll. The driver laughed bo boisterously. Plenty more where this came from, eh, Hank? You bet. My roll makes his look like a flat tire. Just feast your eyes on this. He flashed an even larger roll of bills in the amazement of the in the amazed attendant's face. The filling station man shrugged. I'll have to go inside to get your change. The moment he had disappeared, the third man in the car muttered to his companions, You fools! You you want to make him suspicious? Pipe down! He spoke in a low tone, but the wind carried his voice in Nancy's direction. A race is right, the driver admitted. The fellow is only a cornball, but we can't be too careful. The attendant turned with the change. The driver pocketed it and drove off without any, without another word. Nancy instinctively noted the license plate number of the car. On impulse, she went to a phone booth and dialed her friend, Chief McGinnis of River Heights Police Department. I'll ask him to let me know who owns both the sedan and the foreign make that slowed down at George's house. She determined. Then I'll find out about the driver, the woman wearing the blue jade, the man named Maurice, and Hank, and maybe about the man in room 305. Chapter 6. A Worrisome Journey. Some class, huh? The attendant remarked to Nancy 
as he came back to her car. Must be millionaires. Or wrecked tears, Nancy thought. As soon as her gas tank was filled, she paid the bill and hurried back to the lunchroom. Girls already had been served. What took you so long? Bess asked. Another car drove up and I had to wait. Nancy answered simply. She sat down, thoughtfully eating her sundae. What's the matter with you? George demanded presently. You've hardly said a word since you sat down. Nancy looked around and saw that no one was seated near their table. In whisper, she told what had happened. Oh dear, said Bess. Maybe that man on the train found out where we were going and is on his way there too. Don't be silly, George chimed, chided her cousin. If he, if he's in some shady deal around River Heights, he'd be glad to have our young sleuth out of the way. Joanne looked a bit worried, but all she said was, I think we'd better be on our way. I have to be there before that man comes to buy the farm. I must talk Graham out of it. The girls finished the Sundays and picked up their checks, but Nancy insisted upon paying. I want to break this $20 bill Dad gave me, she said. I've spent most of my smaller bills. The waitress changed the bill for her without comment, and the girls left the lunchroom. As they climbed into the car, Nancy glanced anxiously at the sky. There was a dark overcast in the west doesn't it doesn't look like rain over my way Joanne observed and we leave the paved road and take a dirt one about five miles from the farm I'm afraid it's going to be a race against time Nancy warned starting the car a bad storm on a dirt road won't help matters at all the girls now noticed a change in the countryside. The hills had become steeper and the valleys deeper. The farms the farms dotted the landscape were the farms dotting the landscape were very attractive. Nancy had Nancy made fast time for she was bent on beating the storm. The sky became gloomier and overcast. Soon, the first raindrops appeared on the windshield. We're in for a downpour, all right, Nancy declared grimly. As she turned onto, a, onto the dirt road, soon there was thunder and lightning, and rain came down in torrids. Listen to that wind, Bess declared. It's enough to blow us off the road. The next minute, everyone groaned in dismay, and Nancy braked the, the car. Across the road stood a wooden bl blockade. On it was a, sign, was a sign. Detour. Bridge under repair. George read it aloud in disgust. An arrow on the sign indicated a narrow road to the right. As Nancy made the turn, Joanne gave a sigh. Oh dear, said she said, this back way will take us much longer to reach Fredgate. The detour led through a woodland of tall trees. Daylight had been blotted out entirely, and even with the car's headlights on full, Nancy could barely see ahead. Again, she was forced to, to, to slow down. Suddenly, a jagged streak of lightning hit a big oak a short distance from the car. It splittered, it splintered the tree. Oh! Screamed Bess. This is terrible! 
Nancy pretended to be calm, but she was really very much worried. She decided it would be much safer to get away from the dangerous line of trees. Any one of which might crash down on them. How long is this stretch of woods? She asked Joanne. Oh, perhaps 500 feet. We'll have to chance it. Nancy drove as quickly as she dared in the darkness. The girls breathed sighs of relief when open country was reached. But Joanne's fears were not yet over. Watch out! She advised. There's a sharp, treacherous curve very soon, just before we take the turn off for the farm. By now, the brief storm had moved off to a distant sky, and it was easier to see the boundaries of the slippery road. Nancy rounded the curve, but as the car soon, but as the car took the turn, the wheels on the right side sank into the thick mud of a ditch, bringing the car lur to a lurching halt. The unexpected mishap stunned the girls for a moment. Finally, Bess found her voice. Now what? Nancy endeavored to drive the, the car out of the ditch, but it was useless. Well, she sighed, we may as well jump out and examine the car. Keep your fingers crossed. They found the convertible uh, at a lopsided angle. The right wheels, however, were firmly anchored by the mud. The four girls attempted to push the, the car, but without success. I'll look in the trunk, Nancy said, to see if there's any, to see if there's something to help us. Nancy found two pieces of heavy burlap. Bess and George put them in front of the two back wheels for traction. Then they gathered Then they gathered and broke up some brush to make a mat for each tire. I hope this works, Joanne said, taking her place to assist in pushing there's, there probably won't be anyone else using this desolate road who can help us. I'm afraid we won't reach the farm in time. Nancy stepped into the car and started the motor, easing the gas and slowly rocking the convertible back and forth. Inch by inch, the tires crept forward, finally catching on the burlap and brush and rolling out of the ditch. We've done it! Bess shouted proudly. With a little outside help, George panted with a grin. The girls laughed from sheer relief. They started, they started off again, more slowly than before. But they had on they had gone only a mile when a new storm seemed to be coming up. In less than five minutes, complete darkness descended again, bringing another deluge of rain. Deafening thunder claps instantly followed vivid forks of lightning. Uh, of necessity, Nancy once more kept the auto automobile at a snail's pace. It was impossible to see more than a few feet ahead. Anxiously, Joanne kept glancing at her watch. It's, it's 515, she announced nervously. Nancy tried to assuage the, worry, the worried girl's fears. The storm may have delayed your grandmother's collar. The, the wind and rain continued unbated as the convertible climbed the brow of the hill. 
There was a brilliant flash of lightning. George, who was seated in front with Nancy, screamed. Don't hit her! Nancy jammed on the brakes so quickly that the rear of the car skidded around sideways in the road. Who? She demanded, horrified. The woman in the road! Didn't you see her? Maybe she's under the car! Heart sick, Nancy jumped out one door. Bess another. They peered under the car, alongside it, in the back of it. They could see no one. Are you sure you saw a woman? Nancy inquired. Just then, another streak of lightning illuminated the sky, and Bess called out, There goes someone running across the field! Nancy glanced quickly in the direction and saw a running figure of a woman. At that same moment, the woman looked back over her shoulder, revealing a thin, haggard face. Nancy judged her to be in her early fifties. The four girls stared in mystification. Nancy and Bess returned to the car, and the journey was resumed. Why would any sane person be walking in such a storm? Bess spoke up finally. She's headed in the direction of the cavern, said Joanne, and explained that there were now nearing the that they were now nearing the farm. Maybe she's one of those strange people over there. Nancy and her friends were immediately curious. Before they could ask what Joanne meant, the car reached the crest of the steep, steep, steep hill, and Joanne cried out, There's her gate farm! She pointed to the, the valley below them. The storm had let up, and the sun was coming out. The, ri the River Heights girls could clearly see the 40-acre farm and its grove of pine trees and a windy river which curled along the valley. Everything looked green and fresh after the heavy rain. It's beautiful, exclaimed, exclaimed Bess, and, and cool and peaceful, Joanne added excitedly. Don't count on much relaxation with Nancy around, George advised their new friend. She'll find some adventurer to, to occupy every waking hour. Yes, Nancy agreed. Adventure with mysteries added. Nancy smiled. She reflected on the two mysteries she had already encountered. The unsolved case of the blue jade perfume and the strange coat. As the car descended into the valley, the girls caught a better glimpse of the farm with its huge red barn and the various ad adjoining sheds and the large rambling, ho rambling house parted, partly covered with vines. There were bright red geraniums in the window, boxes and freshly painted picket fence surrounding the yard, the yard. Nancy stopped the car in front of the big red gate, which opened into the garden. Oh, I hope I'm not too late, Joanne cried as she sprang out to unlatch the gate. Chapter 7 Nature Cult Nancy drove into Redgate Farm and parked. She consulted her watch and noted with dismay it was a quarter to six. By now, the farmhouse door had opened, and a gray haired woman with a crisp gingham dress and white apron came hurrying out to meet them. 
Her blue eyes were bright as she welcomed Joanne warmly. My granddaughter told me how kind you all were to her in the city, she said to Nancy and her friend. I can't thank you enough. Graham! Joanne excla exclaimed. I can't stand the suspense. Did you sell the farm to the man? Mrs. Bird shook her head. Mercy! I was so excited at your coming back, I forgot to tell you. He phoned a little while ago and said that, because of the storm, he'd rather come here tomorrow. He could wait one more day. Not only Joanne, but her visitors heaved sighs of relief. Further discussion of the subject was deferred when Mrs. Bird insisted the girls freshen up for supper. They entered the large rambling house and a little later everyone sat down in the plainly furnished but comfortable dining room. Mrs. Bird appeared very happy but she bustled about serving the delicious meal of hot biscuits, sizzling ham, sweet potatoes, and coffee. The girls had not realized how hungry they were. Nothing like driving through a storm to work up an appetite, George grinned. It was not until dessert, freshly baked lemon meringue pie, that Joanne mentioned again that what was uppermost in her mind. Graham! She said gently, please call up the man and tell him that you don't want to sell our farm, please. We'll find a way to, to stay here somehow. I'm sure there'll be answers to your ads for boarders. Nancy quickly spoke up. Yes, Mrs. Mrs. Bird, it certainly would be a shame to give up Redgate. And besides, George Bess and I would like to be paying guests for a while. If you'd like us to stay, that is. Of course, I want you all here as long as possible, but I can't really accept any money, Mrs. Bird protested. You have been so wonderful to Joe. If you won't let us pay, if you won't let us pay our share, we'll have to return home tomorrow, Nancy insisted. Mrs. Bird finally relented and declared with a smile, I believe I was just waiting to be dissuaded from taking that Mr. Kent's offer. I'll call him right now. He gave me his telephone number. The girls followed her into the kitchen and sat down while Mrs. Bird went to the phone went to the phone there and put in the call. Mr. Gent, I've decided not to sell Red Gate Farm at any price. No, I, no, absolutely. The woman winced and held the phone away from her ear. Nancy and her friends exchanged glances. The man was evidently inc incensed and was speaking so loudly they could hear his voice easily. Finally, Mrs. Bird put down the receiver. Well, I'm glad that man isn't going to own Redgate, she declared. He certainly was unpleasant. He even said I might regret my decision. Joanne's face was radiant, and she hugged her grandmother. I feel so much better now. She turned to her friends. Somehow I know you're going to bring us luck, Nancy, Bess, and George. Suddenly, Mrs. Bird said, Goodness, I've forgotten to look in our mailbox today. I'll go. Joanne hurried outside and was back in a minute, several envelopes in her hand. Graham! One of these is from the Round Valley Gazette. Do you think? Excitedly, she handed the mail to her grandmother. 
The girls watched eagerly as Mrs. Bird tore open a long, bulky envelope and took out a number of enclosed letters. She looked at she looked at them quickly. A smile spread over her face. Graham, are they answers to the ad for boarders? Joanne asked excitedly. Mrs. Bird nodded. I can hardly believe it. Two people are arriving the day after tomorrow. First, uh, Mrs. Salisbury and Mrs. Abbott. Several others will come later this month. Wonderful, Nancy said, and immediately offered her assistance in getting rooms ready. Count Bess and me in two, said, said George. Joanne and her grandmother at first murmured, but were outvoted. Very well, Mrs. Bird smiled. Tomorrow afternoon will be time enough to get things ready. Later, as the guests bid her good night, Mrs. Bird said, Joe, I was, Joe was right. You three girls have brought us luck. Bless you. George and Bess were shown to the room in which they would sleep. Nancy was to share Joanne's bedroom. Oh, how sweet it smells in here, Joanne commented as she, as Nancy unpacked. <laughs> That's some of the oriental perfume which splashed on my clothes clothes in the train, said Nancy. It certainly has a strong and last it certainly is strong and lasting. When Nancy awoke the next morning, warm sunlight was streaming through the windows. Joanne had already gone downstairs. Nancy first thought Nancy's first thought was to phone police chief McGinnis and find out about the owner or owners of the cars driven by the suspicious man. After dressing hurriedly, she went to the first floor and placed the call. Good morning, Nancy, the officer said. Here's the information you wanted. Both cars were rented from Drive Yourself Agencies by a man named Philip Smith, a, a native of Dallas, Texas. They've They've been returned. Nancy thanked the chief and hung up. That clue wasn't any help, she thought. None of those... None of those suspicious men talked like a Texan. The name Philip Smith was probably phony and made up on the spur of the moment. Also... A Ford's driver's license might have been used. Presently, Bess and George came down, and the girls enjoyed a delicious breakfast of pancakes and sausages. Afterwards, Joanne took the girls on a tour of the farm. She showed them the lovely gardens, a large chicken house, and her pet goat, Chester. A, tur a turkey took a dislike to Bess and chased her to the farmhouse porch, much to the amusement of the onlookers. Joanne, Joanne came to rescue and chased the turkey away. Our farm isn't very well stocked, she admitted as she led the way to the barn. We keep only one cow and one workhorse. Poor old M Michael should be retired on a pension, but we can't afford to lose him yet. Joanne cheerfully hailed the hired man. Reuben Ames was about 40 years old, red-haired and ra rather quiet in manner. He acknowledged each introduction with a mumbled, Pleased to meet you, miss, and extended a work-worn hand for each girl to shake. Reuben shifted uncomfortably and then returned to the barn. 
Reuben is as good as gold, even if he is bashful, Joanne told the girls. I don't know what we'd do without him. We'd better keep an eye on Bess, George teased. She'll be breaking another heart. Bess made a good nate made a good-natured retort as the girls started for the orchard. George demonstrated her agility by climbing the nearest apple tree. Once by once back at the farmhouse, Nancy asked curiously, Joe, please tell us more about the cave that you spoke about yesterday. I'm bursting to know all about it. Well, the cave is on a piece of land along the river which Graham rents out. Oh, then I suppose it'll be impossible for us to visit the cavern. Nancy commented. I don't see why we can't. It's still our land, Joanne frowned. A queer lot of people are renting it, though. How do you mean? Nancy questioned, recalling Joanne's remark of the previous day. They're some sort of se a nature cult. I think, and part of a large organization. At least that's what it said in the letter Graham received from the leader. Anyway, this group calls itself the Black Snake Col Colony. Pleasant name, Bess observed cynically. I'm not sure what they do, Joanne admitted. We've never even spoken to any of the members. I suppose they believe in living an outdoor life? You can live that way without joining a nature cult, George said dryly. I suppose they dance when the dew is on the grass and... I suppose they dance on... I suppose they dance when the dew is on the grass and such nonsense believe it or not they do dance Joanne laughed but only nights when the moon is out I've seen them from here in the moonlight in the moonlight it's an eerie sight they wear white robes and flit around waving their arms they even wear masks. Masks? Nancy exclaimed. Why? I can't imagine. It all sounds senseless, but the rent money is helpful. Do they live in, the, in this cavern? George asked in amazement. No, they live in shacks and tents near the river. I've never really had the nerve to visit the place. Of course, if you girls went along. When can we go? Nancy asked ex excitedly. I'll speak to Graham, Joanne offered. It's odd you've never spoken to any of the colony members, Nancy remarked thoughtfully. Who pays the rent? It's sent by mail. They never even leased the land that way. Didn't it strike you as a peculiar way of doing business? Nancy asked. Yes, Joanne admitted. But I suppose it's part of their creed, or whatever you call it. They probably don't believe in mingling with people outside of the cult. That's often the case. Directly after lunch, the girls helped the birds straighten and clean the rooms for the expected boarders. They hung curtains, newly made by Mrs. Bird, and put fresh flowers in each room. At the end of the afternoon, they were very pleased with the result. All you girls have worked hard enough, Mrs. Bird said. You go rest while I fix supper.
She was insistent, so Joanne led her friends to the porch. Beth stretched out in the hammock and picked up the day's newspaper. The others chatted. Suddenly, Beth gave an explanation of surprise. Nancy! She asked tensely, What was the name of the girl who sold you, sold you that perfume? Wong? Nancy answered in amazement. Yvonne Wong? Yvonne Wong. Why? Because there's an article in the paper that mentions her name. Bess thrusts the newspaper into Nancy's hand, indicating the paragraph. Wow, this is something. Read it for yourself. Chapter 8, Hillside Ghosts. Nancy read aloud. The Hale Syn Syndicate. The Hale Syndicate, which has been an engaged in an illegal importation of Oriental art articles, has been dissolved by court order. Nancy looked up and said, I don't see what that has to do with our perfume perfume friend Yvonne Wong. A great deal, Bess declared. Read on and you'll find out. Oh, Nancy exclaimed a few seconds later. Yvonne was employed by the syndicate as a clerk in their shop. She hasn't been indic indicted in Indicted because of insignificant insignificant evidence, and the top men have skipped. Bess nodded, realizing the impact of her important discovery. That perfume store we visited must have been owned by the syndicate. How long ago was the fraud discovered? George asked. The article doesn't say, Nancy returned. It has just now been made public. It doesn't surprise me that the Wan girl was mixed up in some underhand affair, George remarked. It didn't I didn't like her attitude from the beginning. Nor did I, Bess added. And I liked her and I liked her less after Nancy found out she had received the job Joe wanted. I'm certainly glad I didn't get the job, Joanne smiled. I'd much rather be here. Do you suppose Yvonne knew the work of the syndicate was dishonest? Bess asked with concern. I'm sure of it, George answered flatly. But it looks as if she and the others skipped out quickly when the federal authorities became aware of the ra ratchet. All this time, Nancy had been staring into space. It had occurred to her that you... Yvonne Wan might still be employed by the syndicate. Undoubtedly, the name and offices had been changed to throw off the federal authorities. Was room 305 now the syndicate's headquarters? Nancy immediately thought of the coded message she had brought with her. Third number in it five was the letter. She told herself. Then she reflected on the recent newspaper article in the syndicate. This H might stand for Hale, she thought excitedly. And the line over it might mean that someone by this name is important. The ringleader, perhaps. I must talk to Chief McGinnis again. 
I may have stumbled onto a clue to those missing hail syndicate men. After supper, she phoned the chief and propound, pro, pro, propounded her theory. Well, Nancy, he said, it sounds as if you might have picked up a clue. Sure enough. Send me a copy of that code and I'll get busy on it. After Nancy completed the call, she and the other girls studied the code once more, gazed at the 16 and the 5. Excuse me. Nancy suddenly said, M. M. Why, that could stand for, for, for Maurice. Maybe the man's name is Maurice Hale. Now I'll sleep better. Beth sighed. The girls went to bed happy and excited. The next day, everyone's attention was focused on, the, on a new boarder. Shortly after church services, Mrs. Alice Salisbury and her daughter, Nora, arrived in an expensive sedan. Mrs. Salisbury walked with a cane and complained loudly of her arthritis as the girls helped her into the house. Nona waited only long enough to see that her mother was made comfortable. Then she announced that she must hurry back to the city nearby where she lived. Mother was born on a farm. Mother was born on a farm, she told Mrs. Bird as she stepped into the car. And she simply pines for the country. I thought this arrangement might be ideal since she's never entirely happy with me in the city. I'll drive down to see her weekends. I do hope she'll be happier here in, at Redgate. Joanne and her friends hope so too, but they were not at all certain for it because increasingly for it became increasingly apparent that Mrs. Salisbury could not be happy anywhere. She found no fault with the She found no fault with the immaculate farmhouse or the lovely view from her bedroom window. But she constantly complained of her various aches and pains. She talked in, in, incessantly about her many operations. She, she had a sharp tongue and delighted in using it. She wouldn't be so bad if she... If only she'd stop talking operations. George, uh, George burst out. Makes me feel as though I'm ready for the hospital myself. By the time the girls had adjusted themselves to Mrs. Sal Salisbury, the second boarder had arrived. He was Carl Abbott. A diamond in the rough type of man in spite of his 63 years. He boasted that he was as spry as his son, Carl Jr., who had brought him. Carl Jr., who worked in a nearby city, was a personal, personable young man. The girls, particularly Bess, were sorry he could not remain with his, could not remain with his father. The girls liked Mr. Albert very much, but they were appalled by his tremendous appetite. I wish we could turn I wish we could turn him out in the yard to forge for himself. Jo 
Joanne sighed several days later as she peeled her second heaping pan of potatoes. It's all I can do it's all I can do to keep one helping ahead of him. It's all I can do to keep one helping ahead of him. At first, Mr. Albert insisted upon remaining in the kitchen, teasing the girls as they walked, worked and sampling the food. Then he fell into the habit of sitting on the front porch with Mrs. Salisbury and chatting with her for a few hours. Frequently, they became involved in violent arguments about trivial matters just for d diversion. Yeah, diversion. After one of their disagreements, Mrs. Salisbury would maintain a stony silence, which was refreshing. But Mr. Albert would once again take refuge in the kitchen. In spite of such slight annoyances, the days at Redgate Farm passed very pleasantly. Nancy would go into town on various arrangements arrangement errands on various errands for the boarders and sometimes Mrs. Bird. One day she had just returned to the farmhouse from a shopping trip and on her way to the house stopped stopped at the mailbox. There might be a letter from dad, she thought, and drew out out a sack of mail. She took it all into the house where Mrs. Bird asked Nancy to distribute the letters. As she was sorting them out, she came to one addressed to the Black Snake Colony. Look, Nancy exclaimed, this letter belongs to the nature cult. The mailman must have put it in our mailbox by mistake. What will do what will we do? asked Beth seriously. Drive drive over with it? Of course not, growled Mr. Albert, who had just entered the room. You keep away from those out Outrageous people take it back from take it back to the post office Nancy studied the post mark it was very blurred could it be Riverside Heights or was she mistaken her curiosity about the mysterious cult was now even more aroused. Perhaps she could deliver the letter in person, but she got no further in her plan, for just then a neighbor passed on his way to town. Mrs. Bird handed him the letter to remail. Nancy felt disappointed, but as she, but was determined to find out in some way what was going on over the hill. I can only be alone with Bess and George a little later. Maybe we can come up with a pl some plan, she thought. There had to be a letter from Mr. Drew in informing Nancy that he had returned home. At least dad's make there had been a letter from Mr. Drew informing Nancy that he had returned home. At least Dad's making progress on his case, she said to herself. Then Nancy hurried off to the barn where the city slickers, as Ruben called them, were, were to have a milking lesson. It's no trick at all. Bess insisted. Give me that pail and I'll show you how it's done. Reuben handed over the bucket and Bess marched determinedly up to the cow. 
nice, Bossy, she murmured, giving the animal a timid pat on the neck. The cow responded with a suspicious look and a flirt of her tail, as Bess sit, sat down the milking stool and the cow kicked it over. Bess sprang back in alarm. You can't expect me to milk a vicious cow, she exclaimed. Joanne and Reuben exploded with laughter. <laughs> Primrose is an extremely smart cow, Reuben drawled. She won't stand being milked except from the side she's used to. Reluctantly, Bess picked up the overturned stool and went around to the left side. The cow leisurely moved herself sideways. I give up. Here, you try it, George. Oh no, Bess. I won't spoil your fun for anything. After a great deal of maneuvering, Bess, Bess succeeded in handling the whole procedure to the satisfaction of Primrose. Nancy came, Nancy came last, and sh she too was a bit awkward. When Reuben finally sat down to do the milking, the girls watched him with admiration. It just takes practice, he said, smiling. That evening, Mrs. Salisbury and Mr. Abbott had their usual disagreement and both retired early. Mrs. Bird soon followed, leaving the girls alone on the porch. Do you think there will be any activity on the hill tonight? George asked suddenly. I'm not sure, Joanne answered, but it's a good clear night and the moon is full, so the setting is perfect for it. I'm dying to see what those nature enthusiasts look like, added Bess, just so they don't come too close. It was a lovely evening and Nancy had been only half listening to the chatter. She remained silent and thoughtful. The letter addressed to the black snake colony was still very much on her mind. What's up, Nancy? Bess finally asked, noticing her friend's silence. Three guesses, Nancy replied with a laugh. I'm still curious about that envelope. I had, I had in my hands this afternoon. I'm almost certain that blurred postmark Red River side heights. Even, even if it did, George remarked, it could have been written by almost anyone and simply mailed in Riverside Heights. I suppose you're right, Nancy agreed. I guess I'm trying too hard, but let's walk over toward the hill. The four girls started off. They crossed one field in front of the house and were just climbing the rail fence to the next one when Nancy cried out, Am I seeing things? Look! Over there! On the hill! Following her gaze, the girls were astonished to see shadowy white figures fitting about in the moonlight. Ghosts! Bess exclaimed. Ghosts nothing! George retorted, There's no such animal. Don't be alarmed, Joanne said with a smile. I imagine the members of the nature cult are having one of their festive airings by the light of the moon. The girls watched the cult members go through their mystic rites. They're not doing much of anything, Nancy observed, except flapping around. Within ten minutes, the ceremony apparently was concluded. The white figures clustered together for a moment, then moved off across the hillside. I wonder where they're headed, Nancy mused. Back to their tents? 
Joanne had been watching intently. Now she shook her head. I don't think so. I forgot to tell you. The cave has another opening on the slope of the hill near the river. The colony members are going in that direction. Immediately, Nancy's curiosity was aroused. Did this mean the white robe group intended to go into the cave itself? If so, why? To continue the ceremony? It certainly was a short performance, Bess remarked in as the mysterious dancers vanished from sight. I wonder if the ritual has any significance. That's what I'd like to know, Nancy said quietly. And that's what I and that's what we must find out. Not tonight, Joanne said firmly. Grandmother will be very upset if we don't come right back. Reluctantly, Nancy gave up the idea. The girls started for the farmhouse, but Nancy kept looking back over her shoulder, determined not to miss anything. However, the hillside remained uninhabited and still. As the girls drew near the road, the motor of a car broke the silence and headlights appeared. The automobile slowed down in front of the farmhouse as if it was about to stop. Then suddenly the car went on. Why? Nancy wondered. Had the driver seen the girls and changed his mind? she declared thoughtfully. Of course, I don't want the girls to go looking for trouble, but I'm beginning to think someone ought to investigate those mysterious people. If anything questionable is going on, I want to know about it. I'll ask the Black Snake Colony to move out, even if I do lose the rent. Why, I might get into trouble myself if they stay. Mr. Albert and Mrs. Salisbury fell into an injured silence. Nancy gave her friends a sly wink, and a few minutes later they all quietly withdrew to the spring house to discuss their plans here. Here, she told the girls about her conversation with Chief McGinnis. Something peculiar is going on at that cult, at those cult meetings, I'm sure. Nancy went on, and I must find out about them if I can. Do you all want to join me in the investigation? Of course, Joanne and George said. Do you think it'll be safe? Bess asked. I'm not making any rash promises, Nancy laughed. Bess gave a little shiver. I don't like it, but count me in. How can we visit the colony without being caught? George said. That's the problem, Nancy replied. We must make our plans carefully. Before we do anything, I suggest we find out about the robes the cult members wear. We may need to wear similar ones to help us in our investigation. There's only one way to find out, Joanne said. Some night when they're having ceremonial meetings, we can sneak through the woods and try to get a closer look at what's going on. Nancy nodded excitedly. The double entrance to the cave will be perfect, she said. If, if we can't sneak into the meetings any other way, we can get into the cave at the end they at the end they don't use sounds terribly risky to me bess com commented oh for pete's sake george said scornfully don't be such a wet blanket bess 
Her cousin opened her mouth to retort, but Nancy interpo interposed quickly to forestall any further argument. We'd better not tell our plan to anyone except your grandmother, Joe, she advised. Otherwise, Mrs. Salisbury and Mr. Albert will tr try to talk her out of letting us investigate. After a light supper and some rather forced conversation on trivial matters, the girls retired. They had tried to keep silent about the activities of the nature cult, but their secretive m manner did not escape the notice of Mrs. Salisbury and Mr. Albert. You're up to something, Mrs. Salisbury remarked the next morning, and if I were Mrs. Bird, I'd stop it at once. Mrs. Bird, however, went on sincerely with her work, being careful not to interfere with the girl's plan. They maintained a close watch of the hillside, but for two days seldom saw anyone in the vicinity. I think they've hold they've hold in for in for the rest of the summer, George declared impatiently at breakfast. Either that, or the, either that, or they've moved out. The cult's still here, Joanne assured her. The rent check arrives arrived in the mail, morning mail. By the by, the way, where do these nature people get their food? Nancy queried. They can't live on blue sky and inspiration. I think friends must bring food to them in automobiles, Joanne answered. Several times I've seen swanky cars drive up and park near the hillside. The cult members must be fairly well off then, Nancy said thoughtfully. I'm getting tired of marking time. I wish something would happen soon. If it doesn't, I'll, I think I'll investigate that cave anyway. That night the girls were late in finishing the dishes. By the by the time they were they had put everything away, it was quite dark. When they went out to the porch, they were relieved to find that the boarders had gone to their rooms. The girls sat quietly for some time. The moon was high and Nancy from the force from force of habit, glanced eagerly toward the distant hill. Look, girls, she exclaimed. They're at it again. The four girls could see white objects moving to and fro, apparently going through a weird ritual. Nancy sprang to her feet. We'll have to hurry if we want to see anything, she said. Come on, we'll take the shortcut. They dashed across the lawn and flung open the gate and ran through the woods. Nancy led the way up the river path, then to the sparsely wooded hillside. Not until they were close to the camp did she stop. We'll have to be very careful, she warned in a whisper. Scatter and hide behind the trees and don't make a sound. The girls obeyed, best stayed staying as close to George as possible. Nancy found a huge oak tree well up the hills and hid behind it. From this vantage point, she could see fairly well. Nancy had been Nancy had been there for less than 5 minutes when she when she heard the sound of several cars approaching. They came up the woods ro road and stopped at the foot of the hill, not far from not far from the nature camp. Several men stepped from the cars. Nancy was too far away to see their faces, but she did observe that they quickly donned long white robes with 
head masks and joined the other costumed figures who were on the brow of the hill. For nearly 10 minutes, the members of the cult flitted back and forth, waving their arms and making weird noises. Then they moved single file toward the cavern and vanished. Suddenly, Nancy felt herself grasped by an arm. She wheeled sharply, then laughed softly. George, for goodness sake, don't ever do that again. You scared me silly. What do you make of it, Nancy? It's the strangest thing I've ever seen. I haven't been able to figure it out. What should we do next? Bess asked Bess, who had joined them. Let's follow them into the cave, George proposed rashly. And be caught? Nancy returned. No, this is serious business. I think it's time to go home and plan our own costumes. I wonder why so many people came here in automobiles, Joanne mused as the girls walked off slowly. That's what I've been wondering. Nancy replied somberly, but I think I might know. Why? Her friends demanded. It looks to me as if only a few persons are actually living in, black, in the Black Snake Colony. Apparently, they want to give the impression that the organization is a large one, so they have these other people come, come the night set for the cerem ceremonials. There were certainly a lot of men in those cars, added Bess. Why should they go to all that trouble? Joanne asked doubtfully. I don't know, Nancy admitted, unless it's because they're trying to hide something they're doing here. She changed the subject. I think we'll be able to make our costumes like theirs. If you'll give us some old pillowcases and sheets. Joe? When when can we visit the cave? We must disguise when we visit the cave, we must disguise ourselves to make our scheme work. 